All right. So um, for those of you who were here uh, yesterday at the summit, you may have already got your fill of uh, momentum data for the, uh, for the summit, but I'm going to be presenting on um, kind of a sub-study we did, a qualitative sub-study around new prevention technologies. Um, so we can kind of get into, uh, into what those look like in a moment, um, but I really want to look at the um, kind of the relationship between education and stigma um, as they relate to these new technologies. So just to provide some basic overarching epidemiological uh, background knowledge here, um, this is stuff we're all probably quite aware of. Uh, we've seen a really dramatic decline in HIV mortality over the last two decades. Um, but HIV transmissions among young gay men, or among gay men as a whole, have remained uh, relatively consistent. We've actually seen increases among young gay men. Um, and as a result of this, uh, gay men remain vastly overrepresented in uh, Canada and British Columbia's HIV epidemics. Um, and this is obviously something that, uh, that's deeply problematic in a lot of different ways. Um, but into this kind of uh, stagnancy in some ways, we've also seen uh, the emergence of new prevention technologies, so, uh, or NPTs as we're calling them here. So by this we mean recent biomedical HIV treatment advances uh, that make use of heart uh, or highly active antiretroviral therapy as a prevention method. Um, and as we're conceptualizing this term, uh, we're kind of thinking about three different uh, interventions uh, that kind of overlap. And again, we're probably all quite familiar with these. Um, so PrEP or uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis, the consistent use of heart uh, by HIV negative individuals prior to potential exposure to prevent seroconversion. Um, PEP, which is a 28-day course of heart taken by HIV negative individuals immediately following a potential exposure uh, to prevent seroconversion. And then kind of the outlier of the three um, tasks for treatment as prevention which is the use of heart to treat HIV-positive individuals uh, to lower individual and population-level viral loads. So it's a little bit less, uh, less directly uh, aimed at HIV-negative men, but uh, still very much pertaining to prevention. Um, and collectively, these interventions have started to shift the way we think about HIV prevention and risk reduction as a whole. Um, so whereas we might have thought of HIV-positive um, individuals from an HIV-negative man's perspective as high risk at one point, this emerging category of undetectability has really forced us to start to think, uh, think about that in, in different terms now. Um, so here's some, some visual representations of uh, these new prevention technologies, which are really gaining um, a great deal of prominence. Uh, and education has long been seen as a, as a fundamental part of uh, promoting NPTs. Um, and implementation will ultimately really require uh, awareness, knowledge, acceptability, and use among gay men. Um, so by awareness, we just simply mean, do you know of this, this technology's existence, this intervention's existence? Knowledge is more looking at deeper levels of understanding. Um, acceptability is more, does this, does this intervention actually work for you, or are there barriers kind of in place? that make that not very practical um, or, or useful to you. And then actual rates of use, um, just who's actually using this stuff. Um, and we've seen that major gaps persist in this education process. Uh, and this is deeply problematic to uptake of NPTs um, and really damages their effectiveness. So we can take a quick look at the overview of some of the, the knowledge we have of education regarding these technologies. Um, so PEP is kind of the most established of the three in many jurisdictions. It's been around for the longest amount of time. Um, however, in Vancouver, it's still a bit more of a recent, uh, a recent phenomenon. We've only had a pilot study since 2012. Um, nonetheless, levels of awareness among gay men here are very high, um, over 50%. Um, so that's certainly a positive. Um, but we also see a lot of kind of gaps in knowledge um, and inconsistent uh, kind of misconceptions those types of things. So, you know, the idea that there's PEP and PREP and those acronyms sound almost exactly identical, that's not exactly helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, there's this misconception of PEP as a morning after pill instead of this more extensive um, course of treatment. Uh, and acceptability has also been a, a factor that a lot of people uh, are worried about. So, am I actually at risk of infection? If you, if you don't feel like you're at risk, you won't actually seek out treatment. Um, and also, there's this barrier of healthcare providers. Are they actually willing to prescribe PEP? And we know of incidences where that, that's not the case, and that can obviously be a major barrier as well. So here we have uh, some images from 
Health Initiative for Men's PEP campaign, um, which is a great educational resource. And we kind of have this, this visualization of PEP as part of the toolkit of HIV prevention. So just adding this, uh, this extra kind of tool to the kit. Um, PrEP education. PrEP is a, is a very recent intervention within the Canadian context as it only really received Health Canada approval in February of this year. Um, not surprisingly, that also means that rates of awareness aren't nearly as high here uh, as they are in some other contexts. Uh, though I would like to mention that uh, these numbers are from 2012 to 2014 and have probably shifted quite a lot already. Um, and we've also seen that uh, following FDA approval in the United States, these awareness rates really uh, skyrocketed. So we expect that we'll see a, a major shift in that, that area. Um, we see additional gaps in knowledge as well surrounding PrEP education. Uh, as mentioned, that kind of conflation of PEP and PrEP is one of those gaps. Um, and just knowing how it really works on a deeper level and how effective it is. Um, and we also see multiple barriers to acceptability, including uh, concerns about adherence, cost, side effects, uh, perceived effectiveness, and many other things. So if you don't have health healthcare coverage for PrEP, it's $900 a month. That's obviously a major barrier. Um, and so ultimately, we see really low rates of use, even in high awareness contexts. Here again, we have another Health Initiative for Men uh, educational resource, their Get Prepped campaign, which is, uh, again, a very recent uh, campaign that they launched earlier this year. Um, and what I really like about this campaign is that it really kind of provides these, uh, these personal testimonies of PrEP users uh, kind of right next to really high quality factual information and all within this really accessible kind of medium. Um, YouthCo also has a really great uh, PrEP resource that we, we can look at a little bit too. Um, so TASP education, TASP is a little bit of a less established prevention uh, strategy in most jurisdictions. There's less research on it and there's a lot less research on how education has kind of functioned around that. Um, in the Vancouver context, we see kind of an exception. Uh, TASP has been actively promoted since 2010. Uh, HEART has been available free of charge since 2010. And it's really a very established form of prevention in British Columbia, which makes our context quite unique. Um, and so as a result of this, we see really high rates of awareness in the Vancouver context. Um, although there are still major gaps in knowledge, in a study that we did uh, with the momentum data, we found that only 14% of participants um, had a comprehensive understanding of this prevention technology. So there's still a lot of work to be done around um, additional education. Uh, and we also see continued issues around acceptability. So skepticism over how, how effective is HEART um, in actually preventing HIV transmission. Um, and also this confusion over maybe uh, interpreting viral load uh, levels, you know, this really medicalized kind of challenging language, um, actually translating that into to knowledge that is uh, applicable to uh, like gay men's lived experiences. And one thing that we've recognized for a long time is that stigma is a major barrier in this education process. Um, so many studies have emphasized this, uh, and this, this kind of occurs at multiple different levels. Uh, these are only three, but these are kind of three to get us, get us started at least. Um, so there's just the stigma around HIV positivity that's still uh, persistent, as we've kind of already been discussing. Um, so this idea that you know, there's, there's fear around partnerships with pause guys, even if they're undetectable. If you've been told that kind of narrative of uh, HIV positive equals high risk, it's kind of hard to break that narrative. Um, uh, stigma surrounding heart use, so the idea of the, uh, the Truvada whore, as we've seen elsewhere, um, and this idea that PrEP users are unsafe uh, and maybe even sick if they're on high, highly, anti, highly, highly active antiretrovirals. Um, and also the stigma around disclosure of high-risk behaviors to healthcare providers. So do you actually feel comfortable disclosing your sexual behavior to your doctor? And a lot of gay men don't. Uh, that's a major barrier. So in order to optimize education, we really need to confront the stigma. And this is something that is recognized by um, local organizations that are really trying to confront stigma while also implementing these new, uh, these new treatments. Um, so just an idea of what we did in this particular study. Um, we're building off of our, our main momentum study. Um, and we recruited HIV negative study participants who reported prior use of NPTs, uh, or at least a NPT. And uh, 
we uh, conducted kind of peer-led, semi-structured interviews with them. Um, and we specifically were asking participants about their experiences of accessing and using NPTs, as well as their perceptions of the strengths, weaknesses, and overall effectiveness of these strategies. Uh, furthermore, we really wanted to kind of get participants to articulate where they, where they were learning about prevention as a whole. So kind of like the multiple different sources through which they were learning about these things. Um, and specifically about NPTs. So this is really like a, a, a qualitative study of NPT use. That's really what the main kind of thrust of it was. Um, and so we conducted 19 interviews, uh, and uh, participants really expressed using many different sources of education around new prevention technologies, including the internet and print media, healthcare providers, community organizations, sexual partners and peers, and we can kind of go through and look at each of those and see what participants said about them. Um, and most participants made use of multiple sources of information. Uh, so they really kind of constructed this mosaic uh, of knowledge from multiple different sources. As we can kind of maybe visualize a little bit here in this really high tech graphic. Um, so all participants were aware of at least one new prevention technology, but their depth of knowledge really varied in our study. Um, so some you know, fell into these common traps of conflating PEP and PREP, uh, or you know, they utilized viral load sorting, sorting and they knew what that meant, but they, didn't really, they weren't familiar with the public health language of TASP. Um, so whether this really like, indicates a lack of knowledge or like a gap in knowledge, or just uh, a difference in like, terminology, uh, is, up for, is up for debate for sure. Uh, we, we didn't really get to analyzing that. But uh, other participants showed like a really, a much deeper degree of knowledge. So asking really complex questions around these technologies, uh, such as around intermittent prep use, which is still something that is kind of a hot topic in, uh, in public health research. And uh, despite this kind of array of different uh, degrees of knowledge, all participants really stressed uh, the importance of education as a form of empowerment, um, and just uh, yeah, just being being informed was was the way to kind of navigate HIV prevention. Um, so I'm going to have some quotes up here, and I don't think I'm going to have time to read a lot of them. So I apologize, but uh, please please read them if if you can. Um, so I'm going to just go through a few of these different sources and talk about the positives and the negatives associated with each of them. So the internet. Uh, was commonly referred to by many of our participants. And the main thing that was really appealing about this source was its ease of access. Uh, you could just hop on a computer from the comfort, comfort and privacy of your home and look up anything, anything you want. Um, and that was really appealing. The internet also kind of offered this alternative to mainstream coverage of prevention. So you might not be reading about PrEP in the Vancouver Sun, but you can jump on, uh, you can jump on you know, an internet forum and take a look at the new breakthroughs that are happening in that regard. Uh, and kind of related to that, we also saw participants emphasizing uh, queer print-based media, such as Extra West, who are also kind of covering these new, these new interventions. Um, however, there were also some kind of negative qualities associated with the internet. Um, participants had a hard time kind of uh, figuring out which, which resources were high quality ones, uh, which ones were factual, and which ones were kind of just conjecture. Uh, and initially, they had this, this difficulty uh, in relating these kind of abstract, medicalized concepts maybe found on the internet to their personal experience. Um, and that kind of damaged this, this resource. So long and short of it, the internet is not just for porn, um, though that is a uh, you know, common use, obviously. Um, healthcare providers were also a major source of uh, NPT education. And participants identified a few major kind of positives here as well. Um, doctors were perceived as being trusted experts uh, on this matter by some participants, uh, had a wealth of knowledge around prevention, um, and participants also stressed that this context offered a, uh, kind of a, a means of asking questions and actually interfacing with a professional. So you could clarify concepts, you could ask kind of pertinent questions that you might not be able to address uh, in other kind of contexts. Um, and there's also this element of convenience. If you're already in a clinical setting to get tested, uh, you're, al you're already there, you're already interfacing with a, with a professional, and so it's really easy to just ask questions in that environment. Uh, however, there were also some kind of serious issues associated with this source. Um, some participants noted that it was impersonal uh, and heteronormative, so again, this, this 
it was difficult to kind of personalize this information, uh, and it was also kind of a little bit uncomfortable in some ways. And indeed, some participants even noted stigma and discomfort, so more, uh, more overt, overt forms uh, of uh, homophobia even in this, in this context, which was obviously quite damaging. Um, and really, other participants noted that HCPs weren't always experts on this stuff, um, mainstream ones at least. So sometimes your doctor was more confused than you were about this stuff. Um, so in contrast to that, uh, community-based providers were portrayed in a very positive light by our participants and mentioned, uh, mentioned by almost every one of them. So these were the HCPs that really had the expertise. Um, they could tell you the difference in risk between topping and bottoming uh, or you know, the, the real risk associated with being with a partner who was unde undetectable. And this is stuff that you couldn't really access through a mainstream HCP. Um, and additionally, you could actually have an open, frank conversation with these healthcare providers about sex, which you might not be able to have with a, a mainstream age, uh, healthcare provider. Um, and other participants really mentioned overtly uh, specific community-based health campaigns, such as health, for, health initiative for men campaigns, um, like naming them by name and talking about them in a really kind of positive, positive light as well. And so there's not a lot of negatives associated with this, according to our participants. But they did, they did acknowledge that there's kind of this, this minimum, like there's, a, there's limits. There's kind of a limit to the scope of these projects, um, both geographically and in terms of funding. So again, we can kind of see the, uh, the Do the Math campaign, uh, another Health Initiative for Men campaign, where you can kind of take a look at your, your level of risk. You can calculate your level of risk, look at a few different ways of mitigating that risk, and, and do that all while looking at some, some bums, which is great. Um, so sexual partners were also, uh, also a major source. Um, and some participants really heavily relied on them. Uh, so there's, there's this idea of this kind of being an organic context, um, because gay men are going to seek out sex. And so if they, uh, if they can actually get some education through that resource, um, that would be really beneficial. And some of them did. Other participants noted that this was more of like a catalyst for further information seeking. So it was like more a spark to seek out further, further degrees of knowledge through other sources. Um, but participants also noted questionable expertise as a potential pitfall of this, uh, of this source of education. Um, so do they really know what they're talking about? Uh, and also this idea that there might be some ulterior motives to education through a partner who might just be trying to get you into bed. Um, and also, additionally, the idea that these kind of conversations, there's some stigma around this, uh, and they're not exactly sexy. They're not something you want to be talking about right before jumping in the sack. Um, so f a final kind of source here was peer education. Um, and this was talked about even more extensively than partners. Um, and so one of the benefits of this was that it was kind of free of the constraints of that sexually, uh, sexually fueled environment. So there's no kind of interruption to the heat of the moment. Um, you can just kind of have these frank discussions with uh, your friends. Um, and there's also kind of this idea of being able to like set your knowledge next to somebody else's knowledge and kind of compare those things and build off of them. Um, and maybe kind of, uh, yeah, check in and see what, what, what actually seems to be factual. And additionally, there's this idea that it maybe humanizes information. So it, gives it makes it more of a, a relatable concept uh, opposed to this abstract kind of prevention knowledge. Um, but we also see stigma operating here. Um, so there's still this kind of perception, this, again, this Truvada, the Truvada horror image that makes talking about PrEP really challenging, in, in, even in social circumstances. And it wasn't a topic well suited to social conversation for some men. Um, so for instance, uh, it might be seen as overly, uh, overly heavy or not, not exactly a, a social, social topic. Really quickly, I just want to emphasize that participants were also seen as uh, they kind of emphasize their own roles as educators and advocates. So they're not just like these passive receptacles of uh, MPT education. They're also educators themselves. Um, and participants really took a lot of time to, to emphasize this, their, their role in answering their friends' sexual health questions, for instance. Uh, and this went beyond just educating to include um, kind of forms of more in-depth support, so connecting partners and peers to care, and uh, other sources of MPT knowledge, ultimately. And uh, we also see uh, 
a greater degree of also advocacy amongst our participants for improved education and support. So kind of fighting for more uh, community acknowledgement of this issue. Uh, and uh, yeah. So yes, multiple sources, strengths and weaknesses. Um, that's all very important. So yeah, you might, you might learn about it from one source, build, build with another source, and then kind of end up sharing it with your friends. So it's kind of this, uh, this cyclical thing. And just a few ideas of how we might actually work to improve this mode of education. Um, so combining factual trusted information with personal testimony. Um, so participants had a hard time finding both of those things in the same space. And also combining high quality information with ease of access. So one of, the, one of the places we might see this is in a campaign such as HIMSS prep campaign where we have personal testimony, we have really high quality information, and we also have this ease of access on the internet. Um, we also need to continue to embrace community-based peer-led education, which is something that we're already doing really well, I think, in Vancouver. Uh, but just a reminder that that's something that needs to continue. And we need to focus on fostering a greater degree of health literacy opposed to just simply awareness. Um, as you know, aware, awareness leaves a lot of gaps in that knowledge. Um, and we also have to acknowledge the role that early doctors may play in this process. So thinking about the internet, for instance, uh, early adopters of the internet really played a prominent role in shaping those norms. And we speculate that uh, the early adopters of these technologies will also shape the norms around them. So they have a really important role to play. Um, and ultimately, we really, need to get, we really need to deconstruct stigma on multiple different levels, as we've kind of noted. Um, there's all these different kind of barriers at the, level of, at the level of healthcare providers, at the level of conversations with your partners and peers. Um, and so we really need to confront prep uh, confront stigma as we're rolling out these MPTs. Um, so this can be done on a case-by-case -case basis, but also at a structural, foundational kind of level. Um, and I am definitely out of time. So uh, here's all this information, and I'm just going to click through and acknowledge all our great partners. Um, yeah, thank you so much.